Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? Around four years ago, I received a phone call in the middle of the night. The phone call was from my father. He had been admitted to the hospital and he was barely coherent. I took a plane out to see him the next day and he did not look well. I learned later in the evening that he had cancer. And so I had nowhere to go. I had only the clothes on my back. So I got into his car, which he would never have let me drive. And I drove to his house. I didn't know the security code to the door. So I had to break in through a window in the back. I slept in a, in a small bed in a spare room that he had in his house because my mother had died three years prior to that. And I got up the next day and uh, I learned that my father's condition was terminal and that he would need to go into hospice. And I was a complete and total disaster. I was a mess. My father died very unexpectedly maybe an hour or two after I learned that he'd be in hospice. And I, again, got into his car and I was wearing his clothes and I went back to his home and I had no idea what to do. I was sitting, looking through his things. <clears throat> I was looking at old photos that my mother had saved of my grandparents looking at them. And at the time I'm 55 now, I was 52 for 51. And I, I just started sobbing. Fortunately, I had a very good friend at the time who came out to visit me. And he, we had been friends for years. And he helped me put all of my dad's things together. He got a rental truck and boxes. And we, we took those things to the U-Haul. And we, we mailed them to my home art that had been my family. I don't know anything about art. And I couldn't have imagined going through that experience had he not come, had he not flo flown down to help me. Slightly after that, I had a conversation with him. We were out for breakfast and I told him that I was going to do basically a sting on the academy, that I was going to write a bunch of fake papers. The conversation did not go well at all. In fact, I was defensive. I didn't listen. I was rude and I was hostile to the man who helped me when I was at my weakest. I apologized but it was too late at that point. I had crossed a line in the friendship with him and I really have no, no excuse for doing that. The moral that I would like to share, and it's one that's essential as we move forward with democratic societies and institutions in the future, is that it's, okay, in fact, that it's necessary for functioning democracies and relationships and institutions to let friends be wrong. And so as we move forward with fake news, with we're more divided, particularly in this country, we're more divided than ever politically, ideologically, religiously, we're more divided over issues. It's okay if somebody doesn't have 100% agreement that comports with your values. Part of the problem we're seeing now in this stage of capitalism is we're seeing a shift, a shift from epistemology to morality. In other words, we're seeing a shift from merely thinking that somebody is incorrect about a set of facts to thinking that they're bad people because they hold certain moral opinions. When, once we do that, we start to other people. We don't look at them anymore as people. We look at them as moral monsters. 
as people who are so different from us that the tendency in mass is to deny them of basic humanity. When we start thinking in terms of morality and not epistemology, Socrates is very clear, for example, in the Platonic Dialogues. He said he's he says that if everybody had the same starting positions, if everybody had the same information, they'd make the same choices. And the reason people make the moral choices that they do is because of the set of beliefs that they have about facts going into a conversation or a life decision. But we've now lost that. We've lost that focus on epistemology and we've shifted it to people who believe different things than we do or uh, um, existential threats. So how do we deal with this? Is there a template that we can use that, that we can straightforwardly um, engage other people in a productive way? And why is that so important in maintaining an essential healthy democracy? The first step that I would advocate for is genuinely listening to people but listening to people not to prove them wrong, but to understand why they, why they believe what they believe. The German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, wrote an, quite an amazing um, set of books called The Theory of Communicative Action. And the fundament, fundamental principle in the theory of communicative action is that you communicate to, to be, to understand, not to be right and not even to be understood. But the purpose of communication is ideally to understand and then to also be understood. Democracy is fundamentally messy. Conversations and disagreements are fundamentally messy. But there doesn't necessarily have to be something deeper at stake. For example, our relationships, our friends, our families. And I see this every day getting worse in the United States. I see deeping, deepening schisms. I see polarizations and I see divides, and I see the slightest disagreements between people and friendships, relationships, and siblings that have lasted for decades. There's a new type of um, attitude that we have that we must put aside if we're to genuinely engage people. So the underlying basis is to not only let friends be wrong, but you do that by listening. The next thing I would suggest in any kind of a polity or any kind of a situation in which you're having a conversation across a deep divide, particularly a political or a moral or a religious divide, is that you want to repeat back to somebody the question, what you think they hold. This is called Rappaport's first rule. So when you hear an argument, someone makes a claim about a matter of fact, a policy position, for example, abortion or immigration, Muslim immigration, what have you. One of the most important things is to repeat that and ask them if you've understood correctly before you continue with the conversation. Even something so simple as doing that will tend to diffuse difficult conversations. Most people you'll find they just wanna be heard. They just wanna know that they're listened to particularly about something that they have strong, strong opinions on. The next stage that, that I would suggest is something that's rather counterintuitive and almost heretical. So we've been taught for a very long time to ask why people believe things. Why do they believe a particular policy position? Or why do they, have, why do they hold a particular moral belief? That's a good question. But the problem with asking people why they believe something is when they listen to themselves back, when they hear themselves, what they're doing is they're just reinforcing the confidence for why they believe something. So they're increasing their, the moral valence that something has. I found from teaching in prisons, from teaching all across the spectrum in overcrowded public universities for decades, I found that the best question to ask and the most powerful question you can ask someone is the following. Under what conditions could that belief be wrong? Under what conditions could that belief be wrong? I've come to believe looking at the scholarship and from 
the, and the literature in my own writing, that that is simply the most powerful and effective question you can ever ask somebody if you want to instill doubt. Most people have well-rehearsed defenses to conclusions that they have, but very few people have any defenses or even think about the epistemology that they have. In other words, how they arrived at the conclusion and how that conclusion could be an error. But undergirding all of this at its core is that people need to know and the people with whom you have relationships need to know that those relationships will not be challenged or questioned. Aristotle is very clear when he writes that the highest form of friendship is between two virtuous people. One manifestation of a friendship of virtue between people is that they speak in a forthright way. And the Greeks call that parahesia, that is speaking truth in the face of danger. If there's one thing that we need right now as we move, move forward in fractionalized democracies and, and our institutions have crises of legitimacy, it's that we need to be able to speak truth and we need to know that the people with whom we're speaking to won't challenge those fundamental relationships, won't challenge the relationships at the core and those friendships can be maintained. The problem, however, is that you can't control anybody else. You can only control yourself. So you can't control how people respond to your forthright speech. You can only control how you respond to somebody else's forthright speech. I'd like to offer one final thing, one final suggestion. And then I'll go through a map of a conversation, a difficult conversation that in aggregate makes our democracy vibrant and healthy. The final thing that I would like to add is that it's essential that you're willing to change your mind. In any conversation, again, you can only control yourself. Changing your mind and saying that you change your mind is not a sign of weakness. In fact, it's a sign of integrity. It's a sign of virtue. So I want to go back and review. There's listening. There's listening with the goal of understanding. Again, we think of Habermas. We think of Socrates. There's repeating back to somebody what they said to make sure that's correct. And just as a little aside, in the hostage negotiations literature, hostage negotiators look for the phrase, that's right. When somebody says, that's right, you know that, they've, that you're understanding what they're talking about. And then asking a disconfirmation question, asking them, asking them under what conditions could the belief be false? And undergirding all of that is the ability or the, um, the attitude that you have when you deal with people who have differences of opinion that the fundamental relationship will not change. And in fact, the disagreement might even be good. To return to the story that I started with in, in the beginning, I wish it had a happy ending for you. I've called my friend repeatedly and invited him to breakfast and he hasn't picked up my calls, but I'm, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm very hopeful that he will pick up my calls. But I'm even more hopeful now that I've told this story that you can avoid the mistake that I've made and listen and don't be defensive and it's okay to let friends be wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, now we have about 12 minutes for questions from the audience, and you will find our volunteers with microphones. So please just raise your, raise your hand, and I'll point, and they will I give will you the say it's somewhat of a, different, of, of a difficult talk to uh, ask a question. Uh, give, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a, a, uh, it's not an easy to navigate talk in some sense. The, the, the principle is very simple. Okay, so we've got a question over there at the back. Uh, also, you can ask in Czech and I will translate. So It's no problem. Uh, my relatives uh, 
An old lady, she's uh, a med of QAnon. And we have a very uh, big problem with her because she believes everything they write and uh, it's sort of dangerous. How to persuade her, how to, we, we, we can't find any contact to her. She's crazy about QAnon. So he, here's what, what I recommend. I've, I've done a lot of work with um, religious hardliners and even so far as to say fanatics, although we don't use, that's not a technical term. The first, we know from the literature why and when people change their beliefs. People are more likely to change their beliefs in psychologically safe environments. And history is replete with examples, as is the literature. So the first order of business is to create a psychologically safe environment. I would like to push back on a phrase of the question, and perhaps it's in the translation is the issue. But it's not a persuasion. It's not about persuading anybody to do anything other than perhaps to think openly and honestly about what they believe. But it's about instilling doubt. It's about asking questions in a systematic way that helps people doubt the beliefs they have, or at the very least, hold them less tenaciously, hold them less fervently. And so one of the ways that the question that I, I posed under what conditions could that belief be wrong is one of the best questions if it's, um, if it's followed. So let me, I'll give you a quick, a quick example for the QAnon. How, if you say to somebody, how could that belief be wrong? Uh, here's another technique you can, you can use. You can ask them to put the belief on a scale from a one to 10. So one is you're positive, it's wrong. Five is it may be wrong. Nine is you're almost positive, it's true. And 10 is that you're positive, it's true. The tendency is to always ask people why they aren't a higher belief. So if someone is a nine, why, why aren't they a 10? So what I would suggest in this case is to ask them why they're not, once you figure out where they are on the scale, then you can ask them targeted questions to help them instill doubt. And again, the key issues is from chapter seven of my book, when speaking to the moral for, to an ideologue, the way to change the moral mind is to sever the connection between the way the moral belief is formed and the, the conclusion that's held. And you do that by targeted questions by asking doubt. So it's a, it's a rather complicated problem. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. We can see I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. So it's, it's not a sign. Uh, but so that's what I would recommend. I would ask, I would recommend asking that at every every stage under what conditions could the belief be wrong? And I can drill down on that, but I only have a few minutes. Let's see if we can get it to, to some more questions. If, don't think about persuading. Think about instilling doubt. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, the lady over there. Uh, on the right hand side. Yeah, hello. Um, actually, I would like to ask you uh, uh, we are talking here uh, about uh, having a conversation with people who have uh, different uh, opinions and they strong uh, belief in their um, the beliefs. But what about if, I, uh, if I'm facing a real manipulator? I mean, um, because I see this, uh, that it's quite common now in these days, and uh, I see it, it's much harming and much more difficult for me because uh, it's a different uh, issue. Those people, they do not believe in what they say, but they just, uh, they just do manipulate you. They have their own reasons why they um, pretend, you know, they believe to what they say, but it's not true. And I, and, and I see this uh, like um, that it's harming me, it's, uh, it's aggressive. And uh, what, are the, what are the tricks? What, um, how to, you know, um, how to play their game the way that I am not harmed, if, if, if I am clear enough. Well, that's, 
That, that's a great question. And you're not the only one that's being harmed. It's harming all of us. And it's amplified by social media. It's amplified by different platforms. And the people most susceptible to this are young people. And it's making us more fragile. In the case of people who are directly manipulating you, my, it, my sincere advice to you would be, unless you have to engage them, don't engage them. Just walk away from the conversation. There are some people who are genuinely bad faith actors, and, and these individuals are simply not worth your time. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. The gentleman in the blue sweater at the back. Uh, I'm thinking if uh, the issue with people having, the, let's say, extreme, extreme opinions, uh, for example, the QAnon problem, isn't it also a problem not about the rationality, but uh, isn't it about belonging? Can we do something Great. with uh, with this? Because because people, I know a guy who is uh, who, who became neo-Nazi because he felt like he's belonging. He's doing something worth it. And and what what what, what can we do in this area to get through through people? That's thank you. That's an absolutely wonderful question. If you read the literature on religious psychology, the only thing people want to avoid more than being wrong, at least being wrong publicly, is to belong. And a sense of community, it's called an ideologically moral, ideologic, IMCC, ideologically motivated moral community. And being tossed out of the community, for example, um, 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 Jehovah's Witnesses have um, um, disfellowship, defellowshipping and different religions have ways to throw people out of the community. And the loss of a community is what makes people adhere to moral propositions. And so that's also interestingly related to why harsh treatment for criminals and punishment doesn't work. It, it doesn't work because those individuals basically have been treated harshly their whole lives. And so, so if the goal is to help them improve or decrease the recidivism rate, then the way to do that is exactly the opposite. It's counterintuitive. It's not, you know, Plato says beating a horse, beating a man makes a, a worse man, beating a horse makes a worse horse. So the, the most important thing there is the sense of belonging. You're absolutely correct. And that's not a rational consideration. It's also why I had previously talked about psychologically safe environments. We know when we create psychologically safe environments, that's simply the best way to help facilitate belief revision and belief change. So how we do that is we create stronger communities and less divisive communities. And in case anybody has been following the debate here in the United States, critical race theory and other things in my opinion, is extraordinarily divisive because it teaches us to look at people on the basis of immutable characteristics like race or sexual orientation. And once we start looking people through those prisms, then the sense of belonging in the community is, is pushed aside. We look at each other on the basis of our immutable characteristics. Okay. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question. The gentleman over here in the black shirt. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was meaning to ask, uh, it's of course easy to, or it's easier at least, to take a more rational approach and a more open approach to questions that do not concern us that directly, for example, matters of the economy and so on. But when we face people who fundamentally question our human worth or some of our fundamental rights, for example, this situation very often comes up when uh, feminist women, for example, like argue with misogynists because those people very often fundamentally question their worth as people. Is it really still possible even in that situation to, um, is it still possible to maintain this form of dialogue? And also, 
if someone is questioning my fundamental worth as a human, is that, is that an idea that is, as you said, it's okay for friends to disagree? Is there a limit to that? And is it okay for a friend to, for example, do that to me? That, that's, that's a wonderful question. And I lament not being at the conference right now. I think I would have had a wonderful time. Uh, so the, the question is, so what is your line in the sand for a relationship deal breaker? That's on the individual and that's up to you. There's no possible way I could answer that question. I would urge people if they haven't heard of him to look into him for five or 10 minutes. His name is Daryl Davis. He's one of the most amazing humans alive. Daryl Davis is a black man. He's a black man who attends Ku Klux Klan rallies. He attends Ku Klux Klan rallies and he befriends members of the Ku Klux Klan in genuine authentic friendships. And he has a closet full of abnegated hoods. In other words, full of, full of uh, KKK hoods that they've given him. If a black man can walk into a KKK rally and has scores of hoods and has befriended people who are very high up in the Ku Klux Klan and personally been responsible for dissolving chapters, multiple, many chapters of the Ku Klux Klan, then yes, it's possible to have a conversation with someone across an extraordinarily deep divide. So I would urge you to look at the work of Daryl Davis because he's an extraordinary man doing extraordinary things. The other thing is if Daryl Davis, a black man, can go to a Ku Klux Klan rally and talk to Ku Klux Klan members, you should be able to talk to just about anybody about just about anything. It's a model and a lesson for all of us. And the more we're speaking across the divide and the more people know that the conversation isn't going to affect the root of the relationship, the healthier our societies, communities, and democracy will be. Okay, I think that's a brilliant sentence to end on. I would like to thank again to uh, Dr. Peter Bogosian. Please give him a round of applause and many thanks for all the questions. Thank you, thank uh, you very much. And I'd like to thank Peter for staying up because it's one o'clock in the morning in Portland. Recording so stuff. I wish him good night as well. <laughs>